Doom. The video game series about a lone space marine battling his way through the hordes of hell. Fast paced, in your face, balls to the walls action, accompanied by the sound of its hard hitting heavy metal inspired soundtrack. Doom is a franchise which should absolutely not be understated when it comes to discussions of genre defining games. A game so important and influential that productivity in the workplace and colleges took a noticeable hit worldwide. So how do you accurately convey what it is that makes Doom Doom when you attempt to switch the medium in which it's presented? At its core, Doom is about that lone space marine powered by nothing more than his pure unbridled rage and overwhelming disdain for the demonic race, brutally carving his way through anything that would dare stand in his way. Traditionally, movies tend to rely on these small little things called character development and a plot. And what makes the Doom games so engaging and beloved is because it views all of that as unneeded extra fluff and throws it out of the window in favour of pure demonic genocidal rage. So surely, whoever would be tasked with transferring this powerhouse of a game series into a feature length movie wouldn't simply just forget about all of these things which make it great and instead just pushing out a mediocre sci-fi story? Now that would just be silly. In the distant and far off year of 2026, in the Nevada desert, scientists uncover an ancient portal between Earth and Mars named the Ark. Since the discovery, humanity has gone on to create a research station named Olduvai on the planet. But recently, an incident has occurred on the station where we as the viewers can see whatever is happening up there has all of the scientists running for their lives, with one of the scientists getting her arm caught in a closing door, resulting in it being ripped away from her body by whatever thing is out there with them. The scientist who locked her out being a Dr. Carmack. And if you're familiar with the early Doom games and id software, you'd probably recognise this as a nod to John Carmack. Or is it a nod to Adrian Carmack? Who knows, there just so happened to be two different Carmacks in the early days of id. We then get introduced to our main characters of the movie, a group of marines. Duke, Destroyer, Kid, Mac, Portman, Goat, Reaper, played by Judge Dredd and superhero killer Carl Urban, and Sarge, played by the one and only Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Because if Doom is known for anything, it's clearly its vast array of characters and interpersonal relationships between work colleagues. The Marines are preparing to head off on leave when all of a sudden, they're informed by Sarge they're going to be heading to Mars through the Ark teleportation system to investigate what's been going on up there. While on the way to the Ark, it's insinuated that Reaper has some kind of baggage associated with the Mars base, and when confronted about this by Sarge, he responds with, I guess we've all got to face our demons one day. Which would actually be some pretty cool foreshadowing if it were indeed demons they would be facing off against. You know, what you face off against in the video games, and what would be completely stupid to replace with something like, say, alien science experiments gone wrong. Now that would be really stupid. After heading through the portal to the Mars base, the characters are introduced to Pinky, a person who suffered the unfortunate result of being one of the early users of the Ark teleportation system, a system which at the time was known for its issues, and one of those issues being a tendency to detach your legs from your body. We then meet Dr. Grimm, a scientist who works on the Mars base, who's been given the task of retrieving data from the servers, and who also happens to be Reaper's sister. Their parents were one of the first people to work on the Mars base, and both ended up dying in some kind of horrific accident. A subplot which is completely irrelevant to about 99.9% .9 of the movie, and only exists purely for the sake of creating unneeded tension between Reaper and his sister, because she chose to continue working in her parents' footsteps, while he chose a career in shooting things. While they're securing the facility and clearing rooms, Sarge enters a weapon room, and in an incredibly obvious fan service way, he comes across a gun which is locked behind a door which requires authorised DNA. The BFG. The gun of all guns in the games. A weapon that could easily clear out an entire room of satanic hellspawn with its intimidating green blast of ferocious energy at the slightest press of a trigger. As a fan of the games, this moment would undoubtedly make you excited to see this thing be used against what ungodly creatures these marines will inevitably have to end up dealing with. But in a very video game-esque way, Sarge is locked out of acquiring this weapon until a later date, and will be forced to return sometime later, you know, when it's convenient for the plot. 
Apparently, an ancient race of humanoids resided on Mars at some point in the past, and that they differed from us measly humans due to the fact that they had an extra pair of chromosomes, which in turn, essentially, made them a race of superhumans. And to survive on Mars, you'd probably need to be some kind of superhuman being. It's not exactly known for being a very hospitable place. The group discover Dr. Carmack, and after almost riddling the man with bullets, they discover that the scientist appears to be in some sort of feral state, where he then proceeds to tear off his own ear while clutching on to a dismembered arm. That's awfully convenient. A DNA locked room containing a super weapon, and then all of a sudden an arm, which doesn't appear to be in use by anyone. Portman and the kid are busy clearing rooms, when all of a sudden, they encounter a naked woman, but much like Dr. Carmack, she appears to be in some kind of feral state as well, where she then rushes at them with a pair of scissors. After they kill the attacking woman, they then realise who that severed arm belonged to. Well, she won't be needing it anymore. Reaper and Goat also make a discovery as they're clearing rooms. They come across another scientist, and much like the armless woman with the scissors, he also appears to be in some kind of zombified state. And he is met by the force of their bullets, which in turn sent him comically flying across the room. While Sarge and Destroyer are searching the station, they're startled by an escaped lab monkey in an air vent, causing it to get blown into a red mist, as Destroyer decides the best way to deal with a monkey is to blast it out of orbit with a chain gun. For some unknown reason, Sarge has the incredibly bright idea to touch the monkey's blood with his bare hands. Which more than likely isn't the smartest thing which he probably could have done, considering by this point, they're all fully aware that something on this research station has got all of these scientists acting like crazed zombies. What if you can catch it from the blood? What if it's some sort of virus or disease which can be transferred through contact? It's probably not the best idea to be going around touching random blood. Then literally in the next scene, Dr. Grimm discovers that there's something unusual in Dr. Carmack's blood. Yikes. We then get our first real look. Not really a look, but an interaction with a monster. They follow the creature down into the sewers, and after they make like Scooby-Doo and split up, the monster attacks Goat, implanting something into his neck, which kills him in the process. Reaper isn't exactly happy about these events, and proceeds to straight up punch this hulking creature in the face before unloading into it. They take the now dead creature back up to the lab, where Dr. Grimm can start researching it and try to figure out what exactly it is and what it's doing here. She sends Duke to go and retrieve her a power saw in order to be able to cut inside the creature, and as he's returning to the lab, he's attacked by another one of those monsters, but manages to trap it inside of a nano wall, forcing it stuck in place. Oh yeah, apparently they have these things called nano walls, which creates some kind of magical scientific hole in a wall. Don't quote me on that. While Mac, Reaper and Sarge are in the mines with the goal of securing a potential exit, Mac, a character which we've probably seen for a combined 30 seconds throughout the whole movie and has spoken little more than a sentence, is attacked in the span of a split second, resulting in his head being swiped clean off his shoulders. Back in the lab, a once thought to be dead goat breaks free from his body bag, clearly in the same infected state as the other scientists. However, Unlike the others, he appears to still have some of his humanity left, and decides to use what little self-control he still has to repeatedly bash his brains against the glass window, killing himself for good before the infection can fully take a hold of him. After witnessing this, and realising the creature she's been examining doesn't have an appendix, Dr. Grimm comes to the conclusion that these creatures didn't kill the scientists, they are the scientists. Portland decides to do perhaps one of the most stupid things a person could do when they're perfectly aware that superhuman creatures are roaming the same enclosed space as them, to go and take a dump. In the process, leaving Destroyer alone, giving a monster the perfect opportunity to attack, violently throwing him back and forth like a ragdoll before launching him into an electrified holding cell. Destroyer puts up a relatively good fight against the creature, and for a brief moment, it seems that he's actually going to be able to escape from it. But ultimately, he proves to be no match for this hulking creature, and it manages to get a hold of him, mere seconds before he is able to free himself. And as expected, the creature also uses this as a perfect opportunity to now get Portman, who at this point is nothing more than a literal sitting duck. The rest of the group hear the commotion, and arrive just in time to see him being mangled. 
Sarge, with his newly found BFG, which he used the severed hand to acquire, fires a large blue projectile towards the creature, which for some strange reason isn't the well-known and beloved green ball of energy from the games. But ultimately, they're too late. After looking at the research data that Dr. Grimm was sent to retrieve, they realize that the scientists had been experimenting on prisoners condemned to death by trying to genetically implant the chromosome that they found on the Mars natives. Of course, that resulted in creating monstrous abominations, which inevitably broke free and killed everyone in the vicinity, because of course it did. In any other non-established sci-fi world, experiments gone wrong would be a perfectly acceptable reason to have these creatures roaming around. But all that this seemed to accomplish was leaving pre-existing Doom fans with one big question. Why? Why would they change the already well-established demonic legions of hell for something completely different? Well, if you were to ask me, I'd assume a change like this would be made for purely financial gain. Chances are that the reason it was changed is probably down to something like making it more financially viable in foreign countries, where demonic themes are generally frowned upon. So hey, why not just remove one of the key features that makes Doom Doom? At this point, a rift is starting to grow between Sarge and Reaper, as Sarge, in a rather headstrong way, wants to carry on with the mission to retrieve the intel whereas Reaper wants to destroy it in order to make sure that this never happens again. As Reaper and Dr. Grimm are discussing the infection, they come to the realization that not everyone who becomes infected turns out to be one of those monstrous creatures. Some people are turned into superhuman beings, explaining the race of Mars people from earlier and also why they may have ended up going extinct. But as they discover this information, one of the creatures has managed to escape the Mars base through the Arctic teleportation system back to Earth. Even though there will be innocent workers and civilians back on Earth who won't turn into these creatures, Reaper believes that because Sarge has changed their mission to containment, he will start indiscriminately killing everyone he comes across, mutated creature or not. With them all through the teleporter and back to Earth, without hesitation, Sarge executes the kid by shooting him through the neck for refusing to massacre a helpless room of civilians purely for the sake of the mission. Right after, they're attacked by a group of the infected and during the commotion, Duke is killed by having his body violently pulled through a metal grate. Then Sarge is also grabbed by one of the creatures and pulled away from the group. Reaper is hit by a stray bullet, and in a last ditch attempt to save his life, his sister, Dr. Grimm, injects him with a syringe containing the infection, in hopes that he will be a part of the group who don't violently mutate from it. And with Reaper suffering from main protagonist syndrome, of course it works. It works so well, in fact, that it's forced everything into a first person perspective for nothing more than simple fan service. This is based off that incredibly influential and probably one of the most important first person games of all time. We'd better shoe in some kind of FPS segment. If we throw in a first person segment of Reaper killing a bunch of creatures, perhaps no one will notice that this movie doesn't resemble the source material that we're attempting to capture cash in on. This segment reminds me way more of a light gun game in the vein of something like The House of the Dead, far more than anything Doom related. It just doesn't have the same momentum and oof that Doom has. It seems far too slow and choreographed. After facing off against a handful of vaguely Doom related creatures, Reaper encounters a very Doom free-esque Pinky demon. It's the character Pinky who's been infected. Get it? It hits him so hard that it knocks the first person out of him. Oh, never mind, it's back. And of course, because it's Doom, and we're going for fan service, we've got to get a chainsaw in there too. Now it's time to face off against the final boss. No spider mastermind, no icon of sin, The Rock. He survived that attack against him, but now he's infected, and after a quite frankly tedious back and forth, they decide to take each other on in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because there's nothing which screams doom, like two dudes beating each other up. In one of the shots, you can literally see the wire pulling Sarge into the air. Reaper manages to defeat him by sending him back through the portal to Mars and launching a grenade in after him. And then, it just kind of ends in a rather abrupt and unfinished way. That being said, that describes the majority of this film rather well. The whole experience feels underbaked and unfinished, while at the same time, it seems to be struggling with what it wants to be. 
To best describe this movie, I'd have to say it's like the first Resident Evil movie, but in space, with light hints of Doom lore and fan service, all while trying and failing at being an Aliens ripoff. To a fan of the Doom franchise, this movie is unfortunately quite underwhelming, and time and time again, it consistently fails at doing what Doom does. Nobody even uses a super shotgun in the movie. How could you leave something as iconic as that out? The movie came out a year or so after Doom 3, and that clearly shows as its main inspiration. An overuse of metallic environments, an overall slower pace, and an attempt to be more horror-driven than full-on action. But even though Doom 3 changed up a lot about the formula, it's still a perfectly fine game. But that cannot be said about 2005's Doom movie. It's not perfectly fine. It does away with everything that makes Doom recognisably Doom. It gives us bland characters with forced and boring drama. They turn the demons into alien science experiments. They barely scratch the surface of what they could have done with the creatures. They outright ignored iconic weapons and unnecessarily tampered with others. An out of place and failed attempt at first person fan service. And they straight up made the final encounter between two humans fighting each other. The BFG, the weapon that could wipe out a room full of these demonic creatures with nothing more than a single shot, doesn't even kill one thing in this movie. They've entirely missed what it is that makes Doom so well loved. Ultimately, coming across as nothing more than a simple cash grab at an IP, which just so happens to be hot at the time, and that's not what Doom deserves. Before we wrap things up, I'd just like to state that this is a first attempt at creating a new series where I take a look at movie adaptations for popular video games. And by no means does this call for the end of the Brutality Of series. There will be new episodes of that every Sunday just like usual, leaving it completely unaffected by this new series. I just wanted to create something a little bit more light-hearted in comparison to what I usually produce, and in order to create a bit of variety on the channel. But hey, more content is more content. Also, I'd like to give a big thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Bort, Hunters263, Caleb Barnaby, Rebecca Pitts, Nicholas, Benz, Jungle Dude, Jakey, Simon Windsor, Benji, Wuxers, Martin Brannan, and Natasha Twyman. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, guys. It means a lot. The channel's also got a Discord server, so if you'd like to discuss this movie or other movies in general with like-minded people, there's a place for people to come together so they can do just that. So thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.